So I welcome you all in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to the worship service of the New England Baptist Church. Those of you who are with us virtually, it's a very special day in the life of the church. It's homecoming Sunday and glad to see some who have been away for a time to come and worship with us today. On the first and third Sundays, we do gather here in the sanctuary in addition to our virtual service so that we can um, share with one another and, and be with one another live. And so in addition to being here together, we'll also worship through communion later. And praise God, we had a baptism this morning. And so Amen. we'll have... Amen. We'll have an opportunity to share in the first communion with our sister Chelsea Brown and her family. So thank God for the day. We give thanks to you all for joining with us and asking now that uh, Deacon Johnson would come lead us in opening our worship with the words of scripture and our invocation prayer. Amen. Amen. Once again, we should name our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Oh, uh, not only for me, sir, but we had baptism. And, uh, so I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Oh, man, this is it. God is going on all the praise right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Scripture reading this morning is going to come from Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. And the third to the 15th verse, I'm going to read. Romans chapter 10. Amen. And it reads, Brother, my heart desire and pray to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they be ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteous of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above, mm. or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ from the dead. But what? But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mind, in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth. The Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. For with the heart, one believes on righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, Who shall believe on him but will not be put to shame? For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whosoever call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear? Without a preacher, and how shall they? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Amen. Amen. This is in God's holy word, Romans chapter ten, verses one to fifteen. Amen. Amen. Let us bow heads in a word of prayer. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us all rejoice and be glad therein. Heavenly Father, we come this morning once again and say thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, Lord, that you allow us to come to pray, to magnify, lift the holy name right now, Lord. Lord, for you us up this morning. Start us on our way to another brand new day, Lord. Yes. Lord, we can't help folks how good, how kind we have been, Lord. But somewhere along the line, we have fallen short and said something, Lord, that has not been right, Lord. But because of your mercy, your goodness and your grace, you allow us to be here. One more time. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, Lord. Oh, who died on the cross. For our sin for the sin of the world. Was buried in our tombs. Over on the third day for all power in his hand. And now sits over right hand in the cloud. Do make such for us and for the sin of the world. Oh, we can glorify you. We praise you, Lord, for this. There is Sunday right now, Lord God. Not only Lord, this is the Son of God. We have baptism right now, Lord on our own, you pray that, Lord. Yeah. We pray, God, to the first thing we move and just to hurt the name of Jesus, Lord. Lord, touch the family right now, Lord, the parents and grandparents on the cross. Give them wisdom, direction, and guidance right now, Lord, so they can direct their Lord and pray to Jesus, Lord. Yeah. But the word said, Lord, we sway the children right now, Father God. And there's going to be some law right now, Father God. And we thank you, God, for the opportunity to do this in the name of Jesus right now, Lord. So pray God that you may bless the past Lord, give us word right there, Lord. Touch the quiet right there, the Holy Spirit power, Lord God. And, and all who are sitting here, Lord, that spirit who are us in my way, Lord. We have so much to be thankful for, Lord. Yes, Lord. We are mighty with God. In Jesus' name, we ask you to pray, Lord. We glorify you and lift you up. And we claim all power of fear. We cast all God on the the name of Jesus. We keep all safe. We bind him out, we cast him to the sea. In Jesus' name, we ask you to pray, our man and our man. Amen. Amen. Man, thank you, Deacon Johnson. I thank you for that scripture because it highlights what we did today. You know, Joseph proclaimed it. Her knowledge and acceptance of Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. And that's that's the requirement for salvation. Amen. And so we celebrate that this morning. Thank you for bringing that up. Amen. Thank you. For, it's part of the, that Jesus called up to my. All right, good. Thank you. All right, so we uh, we thank you, Deacon Johnson, for that for that uh, word, for that scripture, and for that testimony. I heard you earlier talk about uh, what it was like to have a thousand people coming at you to try to take your life. The thing that he uh, has on the emblem on his on his car, that bronze star, means they don't just give those out; they don't give those out to everybody. And so we thank you for your testimony and the true word of how Jesus Christ has brought you through. He continues to bring you through, and it's, it's a good testimony for all of us to be encouraged. Thank you for that. Amen. Well, the choir is here, and I'm happy about it. And so we're going to hear from them, and they're going to pick the things up here, I'm sure. So we'll hear a selection from the choir, and then we'll have our welcome by our sister Carmen Jacobs this morning. Yeah.
coming. Will you come now and welcome our visitors and guests? Yeah, it's unfortunate that this virus uh, continues to uh, perplex us. We had intended to have a, a bigger celebration, but thank God we're here, we survived what has happened so far, and we'll have time for the celebration that we had planned earlier a little bit later. Uh, especially want to thank our supervisor for being here with us today. Uh, we don't She's right out soliciting folks, but we're glad to have her because uh, <laughs> she's a hardworking person and does a lot for our community. I know I've sat in on several meetings uh, in my community in which she has come and responded to many of our concerns. So we're grateful. You know, this voting thing is important. You know, we need to pay attention uh, to what is going on. It's not just about being happy about getting rid of one guy and bringing in another guy. Because what's happening in Congress, what's happening locally, is actually as important in a very critical census year yeah. when they redraw the lines on yeah. who's going to be representing us. And so we thank you for the work that you're doing. And as a representative of our need to be uh, aware and to be conscious and to be participating. And it's good to see you as well. Thank you. Thank you for our visiting friends. God bless you all. Uh, it's that time when we uh, have a special prayer for those who are sick among us. Uh, my wife and I had an opportunity to meet with uh, Sister Rosa Burrell earlier. She's doing well. It's her daughter is still taking very good care of her. Uh, I think it's Scott and I will be going by tomorrow to do something with their family. But I hope you're visiting with the other members of our congregation who are sick and shut in. Uh, it's necessary that we stay in touch. All of them are not online. We know this, but they are in line in line waiting for us to come visit. So please do, please make it a point to go and to visit. Uh, it's also an opportunity for us to give a thanks for our offering. Uh, I've got several envelopes here about for homecoming. We make a homecoming donation of $50, a special gift, not the $50 you were gonna give already, but the other 50. See, I got good news and I got bad news. The good news is the gift for homecoming is $50. The bad news is you're still in your pocket. <laughs> so I pray that you will participate in addition to our regular offerings. You can make those um, online using our resource on our, on our webpage, or you can also make uh, through the mail, post office box 181. And Sister Witson, our treasurer, is very faithful in collecting those. And so anything that you leave today, we would also put in her office as a collection. And so I wanna ask our, our newest deacon, you can teach God to come now and give us a prayer of consolation for the sick and a prayer of thanks to God for our offerings. Speak to God. First of all, I want to say God is good to me. Amen. I was sitting here thinking about God. Little uh, sister, yes. And let's read something from uh, Matthew chapter 13. Uh, Matthew chapter 13 it says, Then people, then people, what them, what the little children, what the little children to Christ for him to lay hands and to pray on them. But the disciples, Jesus said, 
you let that little children come to me and do not hinder them. Mm -hmm. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such, to much of thee. Mm -hmm. Let us pray. Amen. Oh, Father God, we come again. Thank you for all that you have done for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you for touching us with your plan of love to wake up this morning. Yeah. Well, Heavenly Father, we ask that you just bless each and every one of us for their goodness and also their uh, what they did and they served. Yeah. Father, we thank you for our grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for all of the things that has been done in the world. Father, we want to say that. We want to pray for the sick. We pray for the shadow. Father, we pray for those who have, have it to give and have it not to give. Father, we just thank you again in Jesus' name. Father, we ask that you just lay your arm, lay your hands upon each and every one of us. In the name of the name of my name. Amen. 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 Thank you and praise your whole name. Father, bless you, bless our church family, bless our pastor and first lady, bless each and every leader and all our members of the New York Baptist Church. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.
don't know if you've ever had the experience of just coming into the church and sitting. Just feeling the presence of the Lord. It's a powerful thing. So we give thanks to God for being with us today. Here in the sanctuary. It's homecoming and uh, what else could you say about homecoming? What other theme could you use for homecoming besides love? But what's more important than love to the Christian family? And so I turn to the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, the great chapter on love. Apostle Paul is writing a letter to his Corinthian brothers and sisters <clears throat> in beginning at verse one in the New International Version I'm going to read the first eight verses and then drop down to 13. <clears throat> Excuse me. He writes this way. He said, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give all my possessions to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And in the first part of the eighth verse, he says, love never fails. And then at the last verse, 13, he says, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of the word and We'll have our pre-sermon selections by the choir, then our message for the day.
same thing I was thinking. When she said, anybody been baptized, I didn't see no hands go up. <laughs> but we got time and we got water. <laughs> and the invitation for all yours. I thank God for you all being here today, especially uh, to our musicians. Thank you so much in the choir. Certainly adds a lot to our worship service uh, when we have you all here. And you know, I mentioned earlier in the uh, in the praise portion of our of our service together that I had an opportunity to drive through Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York to get to where we were going and back. But I didn't mention Fredericksburg. And Fredericksburg ain't no joke either. And so we thank the British Coast for being here today, understanding they were here early. We made sure that our, our service, our baptismal service was on social media. So we're grateful to you all for the sacrifice that you make. And then our brother Jeremy, also coming from the West End, which ain't no joke. So we thank you all for your service here. I'm not gonna delay you much longer. Uh, the service, uh, or at least the meditation for this morning comes from the 13th uh, chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians. And I titled this, If You Want to Be Happy. If You Want to Be Happy. We've been in a sermon series that's been focusing our attention on hope. Hope. And as part of the messages, I, I tried to introduce this concept of a coin. A coin. On one side, there's hope. On the other side of the coin, there's faith. The two are indispensable, but you know, every coin, this was kind of small, but you know, it's a coin. There's always something in the middle. And the thing that holds these two sides together, faith and hope, is love. Because if you don't have faith and love, then the coin has no value. If you don't have faith, hope, or love. The coin is also filled with this thing called love. Love is that important component that holds it all together. And love is the thing that holds us together as well. Amen. See, in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul gives us this amazing analysis of love. He suggests that it's a progression. See, it, it's a progression. It starts with faith. It, it starts with hope. And then it turns ultimately into love. So without these two essential ingredients, faith and hope, you can't experience God's full expression of his love. There's no place you can't go and escape the love of God. No matter how deep our shortcomings, no matter how frustrating the defeats we have in life, no matter how difficult things are for us, no matter how many times we failed, love is capable of picking us up and carrying us through. That in mind, I'd like for us to examine what Paul says are the three pillars of the Christian faith. He says, now abide these three, faith. Christianity would certainly not exist without it. By faith, Abraham was justified. Moses demanded before the king, let my people go. By faith, Jesus said, we are able to move mountains that are blocking our blessings. Yeah. By faith, the apostle Paul said, we are justified. By faith, there's no other way for us to come to God. We can't get there by our works that we have failed the many times we've tried. By faith we come and then we learn about love. When we believe that God has loved us in Christ, it's then that we are free to love other people. We can't begin to love other people until we love the Lord and love ourselves. There can be no loving action in Christianity without at least this mustard seed of faith. True faith will produce real love. So you've got to ask yourself, what is faith? What do we have faith? Well, faith is Simon Peter stepping out on some turbulent water. Faith is a centurion saying, Lord, merely say the word and I know that my child's gonna be healed. Faith is a woman fighting tradition, fighting through the crowd to merely touch the hem of Jesus' garment. Faith is a widow obedient to make a cake for the prophet and the barrel of flour that never runs out. Faith is Matthew turning his back on his security, his, his tossing his future to the wind to let Christ be his guide. Faith is a group of a hundred 
a group of a, a group of saints who gathered here 154 years ago to proclaim a testimony to God that they would build and continue to worship in this place. Faith is a new group of saints that continue to gather and worship this God who never fails. Oh yeah, there's going to be dangers. There will also be dangers. There will always be trials. Dangers seem to come at us sometimes like waves. They just keep coming and coming and coming. Yeah. And when we see these things coming to us in these waves, do we step out in front of them or do we back away? Do we exercise our faith? Faith is not more important than love, but faith is a prerequisite for love. If you don't have faith, you're not going to get to the end. We'll never love until we have a mindset that convinces us that love is going to be worthwhile. And faith is the assurance that says of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And so now by these three faith, hope, hope has kind of received some bad press over the last couple of years. The world sometimes looks at us Christians like maybe a dope on a rope. Some people see us as being silly minded because we live in expectation and hope. They kind of look at our hope as wishful thinking. And if you ask somebody, if they go into a meeting and the answer they give you is, I hope so, don't look for them. They ain't coming. Don't count on me. But hope is much more fundamental than that. We could not possibly make it in life without hope. Have you ever looked in the faces of the poor? I mean the real poor. Have you ever looked in the faces of those people that are running around with guns killing each other, the young people in our community doing it over and over? If you look, if you will take the time to look in their face, what you'll see is a lack of hopeless. Uh, what you'll see is, is, is hopelessness. You will not find hope there. And so the palmist centuries before, said, before the birth of our savior said, for you, O Lord, are my hope my confidence since the days of my youth. And, and you know, sometimes people do things that have unintended consequences. I heard this expression, you have opened Pandora's box. I don't know if you know about that, but I, I think it's something that I need to tell you about in case you hadn't heard about it, because something that looks attractive actually causes sometimes more harm than good. The story of Pandora's box comes from Greek mythology. The lovely Pandora was set by Zeus to be the bride of Epimethus. Epimethus, excuse me. Pandora is sent by Zeus, the Greek god, to be this guy's bride. And so one of Pandora's really charming things about her was her curiosity. But also that quality proved to be nearly their undoing. It was meant for them to enjoy this box, but under no circumstances were they to open it. Well, of course, the old story of the forbidden fruit kicked in. Once they told her she couldn't do it, it became that thing she, she wanted to do more than anything else. So one day when he was gone, she pried it open and peeked inside and suddenly out of the box flew a swarm of insects and they began attacking her and him. And soon both lovers were stung with this poison that was in the insect's uh, uh, body. And, and the poison contained suspicion and hatred and fear and malice. So here they are, this once happy couple. Now they're arguing with each other. Yeah. He became bitter and Pandora wept with a broken heart. But in the midst of their fighting with one another, they heard a tiny voice crying out from the box, let me out, let me out to soothe your pain. So in great fear, they opened the box again, and this time a beautiful butterfly flew out. It touched the couple, and miraculously all their pain was healed, and they were happy again. The butterfly, my friends, in this story was hope. It's hope that sustains us. It's hope that soothes our pains. Hope is all over our experience as Christians. Have you ever noticed there's a big difference between a funeral and the funeral of a Christian? A funeral can be nothing more than a eulogy where you just come and say some nice words over the deceased. But the theme in any Christian funeral is hope. 
because we are God's Eastern people. We are people of the resurrection. We have this wonderful hope that can't be destroyed even by the enemy of death. When Noah was floundering around for days and days in endless waters, it appeared that all was lost. But then one day, he released a dove, and the dove came back with an olive branch. And, and may I suggest to you here, even if you don't get the Pandora story, the Noah story ought to tell us that that bird, that branch represents hope. All was not lost after all this time, Moses. Things are going to be all right. It was hope that kept Noah and his family moving on, and it will do the same for you. Now abide these three, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. I'm going to tell you a story, another story about a guy. His name was Eli Weissel. He's still alive. He's a very renowned Jewish theologian. He's a very prolific author. He's written like 57 books. He's also a Nobel laureate. He's received the Nobel Peace Prize. And he was a survivor of what happened in Auschwitz, the death camps where the Jewish people went. The name of his book was All Rivers Run to the Sea. And in this book, he tells of his family who was living in Hungary during World War II. During World War II, when the Jews were beginning to be persecuted and hunted down. So his family was sitting, waiting for their time to come. They were waiting for the Nazis to come and knock on their door at any time and take them away to the labor camps or the furnaces. He tells a story about a peasant woman whose name was Maria. Maria was almost like a member of the family, but Maria was a Christian. They were Jews. She was a Christian. And during the early days of the war, she, she continued to visit them. But eventually they stopped the non-Jews from coming into the Jewish ghetto. But that didn't stop Maria. She found her way through the barbed wire and she kept coming anyway. She brought them fruit. She brought them vegetables. She brought them cheese. And one day she came knocking at the door. There was a cabin and she stood up in the hills and she wanted to take the children, all of which Eli was one at the time. He was a small child. She wanted to take the kids and hide them because she knew that the SS was coming. The family decided after a lot of debate to just stay together. Stay together as a family no matter what happened. Although they were deeply moved by this gest gesture from her, they decided to stay. And here's what he wrote about her. He says, dear Maria, if other Christians acted like her, the trains rolling toward the unknown would have been less crowded. If priests and pastors had raised their voices, if the Vatican had broken its silence, the enemy's hand would not have been so free to do what they're doing. But most people only thought of themselves. A Jewish home was barely emptied of its inhabitants before they descended on the home like vultures. He says, I think of Maria often. I think of Maria with gratitude and affection and with wonders as well, because this simple, uneducated woman stood taller than any of the city's intellectuals. She stood taller than any of the dignitaries. She stood taller than any of the clergy. He said, my father had many acquaintances and see even some friends in the Christian community, but not one of them showed the strength and character that this peasant woman did. Of what value was their faith? Of what value was their education? What value was there in their social position if it didn't cause them to love? It was a simple thing. A devoted Christian woman who saved the town's honor. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels but don't have love, I'm just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers in a faith so as to remove mountains but don't have love, I'm nothing, he says. If I give everything I have to the poor, but still, if I don't have love, I'm not anything. Friends, how, how often, how much time do we spend now on the minor things in life rather than focusing on the major? I'm not a critic of social media, but how much time do we spend on this? How many pictures do we have to see of your food? When God has called us, Jesus has called us to go and make disciples. We're going to show these hungry people some food. If we don't go forth from this worship, 
to love people, to extend a helping hand. If we don't leave here with the intention of showing mercy, to offer compassion for people who are hurting, then why are we here? What are we about? Take away all the love and what you got is a big empty building. Pretty, but empty. Nothing here. Jesus said, I've come that you, my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Jesus came that we might be, in a word, happy. Jesus wants us to be happy. In Paul's history, his greatest interpreter of the teachings of Jesus identified three surefire ways to find joy. The joy that Christ was talking about. Three indispensable things that are critical for happiness. And they are, first of all, Find somebody to believe in. This is the spiritual dimension of happiness. Paul said it was his way of writing to his friends in, in Corinth. He says, make your love your aim and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. In short, only live life in partnership with Christ. That will ultimately bring you joy. Secondly, my friends, find something to do. This is the spiritual dimension of happiness. Paul said it when he was writing to his friends at Corinth. He said, find something to do. No life is so satisfied as the one which is making the world better for other people. Perhaps through one's profession. Maybe it's through parenting. Maybe it's through tutoring. Maybe it's through working as a volunteer in some place. Maybe it's representing people before the, uh, the legislature. Maybe it's working at a hospital. There's a thousand different ways to get to this. But in the final end, our lives only find meaning when we give away ourselves to other people. Third, find somebody to love. Yeah. And the rule of thumb here is the more the merrier. If we become love as a people, we are ultimately gonna find love that is lovely. If we will love, we will ultimately find life and love that is lovely. Yeah. As one reads 1 Corinthians 13, it's, it's obvious that Paul felt three points, enough to talk about the bulk of the chapter to it, because he knew that too often we people of faith take love for granted. That is, we assume it's the one area of discipleship that we got that damn path. Our theology may need a little fine tuning. We may not all know ins and outs of the Bible, and our biblical literacy may be in question, but gosh, at least we know about loving. But often we overestimate how easy it is to love. And without loving relationships, happiness is impossible to come by. Why so much attention to love? Isn't that topic kind of trite by now? Isn't it worn out? Isn't that one thing we know how to do anyway? Well, no, my friends, this is the very point. Paul obviously understood is that love is the one thing we all think we know how to do. And because we think we know how to do it, we quit trying to do it. And we stop doing it authentically. We start doing it effectively. And if the topic is how to be happy, our focus sooner or later has to turn to love. For without that, happiness is literally impossible to find. So what advice did Paul offer his friends at Corinth? Very simply, he told them this, treat people right. Treat people right. Amen. He said, love is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous. It's not boastful. It's not arrogant or rude. Love doesn't insist on its own way. It never rejoices in the wrong, but rejoices in the right. In other words, near the core of what it, it means to love somebody is this simple commandment to heed the command of Jesus Christ. Y'all know what it is? Do unto others what you would have them do unto you. Treat people right. And then don't wait too late to treat people right. One of life's most tragic mistakes is putting off love in favor of lesser things and, and losing our chance to say or to do what is needed to be said or done. Paul mentioned numerous wonderful endeavors to which we could commit ourselves. We could speak with eloquence. We could have all wisdom and knowledge. We could profess sufficient faith to move mountains. We, we, we could become even martyrs for God. Giving your life to be burned is what he was talking about there. 
And in our age of parallel image, we could be living such active lives that we burn out in our service. But sometimes, Paul noticed, all these good things get in the way of the main thing, the most important thing. The main thing for Christians is to keep the main thing the main thing. And that is about your life priorities. Paul is saying that loving people is what we are supposed to do. It is the one big thing we try to put off while trying to get all this other stuff done. Oh, when my career is all established, I love some people. When I get my home all paid for, then I have time to go loving on somebody. When I get to be rich and famous, well, then I can go start loving on somebody. When I make my fortune, when all these church meetings slow down, when I'll take my family and have some time with them. Sometimes if we're not careful, times run out before you get to doing the main thing. During the Vietnam War, Dick Johnson, a college student wrote the following poem about her boyfriend. She said, remember the time I borrowed your new car and did it? I thought you'd kill me, but you didn't. <laughs> and the time I flirted with all the other guys that make you jealous, I thought you'd leave me, but you didn't. Remember that time I made you take me to the beach and you said it would rain and it did. I thought you'd say I told you so, but you didn't. And how about that time I dropped blueberry pie on your car rug? I thought you'd really freak out, but you didn't. The time I forgot to tell you the dance was formal and you showed up in your jeans. I thought you'd hit the roof, but you didn't. So many times I thought you'd hate me for what I did, but instead you loved me. You forgave me. You put up with me. There's so many things I wanted to make up to you until you returned from Vietnam, but you didn't. What a terrible and a tragic lesson to learn. Mm -hmm. That we waited too long to do something that we needed to do, to say something that needed to be said. Paul said that real love remembers to keep the main thing the main thing. And ultimately, this is how happiness comes by making sure that love is never misplaced, that we don't keep dropping it down on a list of priorities and that we never wait too late to show it. Amen. Then there's a do the unexpected. Do the unexpected. What could be more unexpected in this day and time than being patient and kind? Try that verse out as you stand in a long line at the bank. Try that patience thing when somebody swerves in front of you and almost knocks the front end off your car. You're coming from the left lane all across you to make an exit off the thing. You know what I'm talking about. I did a lot of driving lately. I got a lot of stuff going on. I need some help. Love is not jealous or boastful. It's not arrogant or rude, he's saying. That is, of course, unless there's somebody in your office, somebody that's driving a new Lexus, or somebody whose kid got accepted to a, a private school, then maybe being jealous or rude could be a little bit more difficult for you. Of course, it's not your car or your child, then boastful and arrogant are pretty easy to come by. Love does not exist on its own. It's not irritable or resentful. If you ask a marriage counselor, they'll say love does not rejoice in the wrong, but rejoices in the right. Oh, here it is. You hear it at weddings all the time. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. And my friends, we have all lived long enough to know that's not typical. It's unexpected. When somebody does something really nice for you, when somebody really loves on you, ain't it a surprise? That's just not the way we do business in the world we live in today. But the surprising way of love is a way to be kind to have the happiness that the world seems to not be able to give any longer. It's our responsibility as disciples of Christ to be the love bringers. Do the unexpected. A friend of mine travels a lot and he said one of the things he really appreciates every time he goes on a trip is to find a note from his wife. She might slip it in a pair of socks, slip it in a suitcase, doing something unexpected. So maybe if you're still in love, if you want to be in love, hide some notes somewhere where somebody's going to find them. <laughs> Taking somebody way back on that one. 
But you can send thank you notes for no special reason. You can send flowers even when it's not somebody's birthday. You, you can call somebody from out of town on Wednesday when they're expecting you to call on Saturday or not expecting you to call at all. But here's, here's a real one. Forgive somebody who's hurt you. Go repair a broken relationship. What could be more unexpected than that to reach out to somebody who you have a real beef with and just say, I forgive you. I want this to work for us. Take time to listen to somebody who's lonely. Give away something for the fun of just giving something away. Give something, do something unexpected to make life beautiful for somebody else. And in the process, you're going to find that your life is going to be enriched. Your life will suddenly become even more beautiful. And then celebrate another person's qualities. Some have the tongues of men and angels, the gift of eloquence, he says. Some people possess prophetic powers. They can influence public thought and policy. Some understand mysteries, have all knowledge. They are smart. They have intellect. Some have all faith and can move mountains because of their religious commitment. Paul says that everybody is different and all is acceptable. It is as it ought to be. None is expected to conform to somebody else's style or be about somebody else's thing or trying to conform themselves to make somebody else happy. One of the most frustrating things I've found in life is, is to try to recreate my world in an image because the world ultimately is going to resist that. And how boring and bland the world would be if, if I was able to make everybody conform to what I wanted them to be. It would be a pretty terrible place. Not terrible, but it'd be boring. Life would be pretty dreary. If everybody looked alike, talked alike, walked alike, dressed alike, thought alike. There was a very small child who was asked in a pre-K class to color a picture of a tree. She took a lot of pride and delight, drew a, a tree, and the tree was royal blue. And the adult leader in the class scolded her and said, Shirley, trees are green. Pay attention. But who said trees got to be green? Why would anybody try to stifle the creativity of a child? I suspect that very adult drives along the parkway every autumn and says, ooh, ah, yeah, look at all the trees. They're everything but green. So much time we meet other folks and say, so what if God made you like you are? That's not good enough. I want to recreate you in my image because I don't like blue trees. I want you to be my creation, not God's creation, to allow somebody else to be different from me to celebrate those differences and learn from them is what the essence of real loving is really about. My friend, Jesus loved the faithful Jews. But his problems were not with Judaism, but rather with your small leadership circle that was perverting the faith. And he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you to myself as a mother to her brood? But he also loved the Samaritans. He loved the harlots. He loved the publicans. He loved the tax collectors who were the exact opposite of the faithful believers. He loved children. Even when, as Deacon just showed us, the disciples thought they were too busy for kids. When a rich young man came to Jesus, the story says the Savior looked on him and loved him. He loved the widow who only had a little mite to leave on the altar. The workers in the vineyard who worked from dawn to dusk came into the hour before quitting. Everybody was the object of his grace. Jesus loved people, all sorts of people, all shapes, all sizes, all colors, and he told us to do the same thing. He said, we'll find joy when we learn to love people. Tall people, short people, young people, old people, rich people, poor people, black people, white people, Republican people, and Democrat people. Women, all people, all people looking for joy, faith, hope, and love abide. These three were the greatest of all is love. My friends, treat people right. Don't wait too late. Do the unexpected. 
celebrate other people's qualities and, and realize every time we give the gift of love to somebody else, that very moment, we are giving the gift of life to ourselves. Love never fails, Paul wrote to his friends at Corinth. Probably this is true. Sometimes though we fail, we fail to love and thereby fail to find the happiness that only loving others can bring. Before we say it's over, we will all be confronted with an opportunity. I said it earlier, when we leave this place, there will be somebody who we have an opportunity to love, to do something, to say something, to give something, be something that makes the world better for at least one person this day. Only by seizing these opportunities can we ever hope to follow in the footsteps of Jesus and find that happiness that he promised. In the final tally, if you want to be happy, remember, happiness is reserved for those who know how to say, now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of all is love. Love, the reason Jesus went to that cross. Jesus went to that cross to celebrate our freedom. Interesting to say that, that he went there to celebrate the giving of himself that we might have the right to eternal life and happiness, not just in the heaven, in the street paid with gold, but right now. We ain't gonna be miserable like this. He's already given us the opportunity to enjoy life and do it in him. And so as we prepare now, to celebrate that great gift that he gave us. I wanna say again, that the doors of the church are open. We were very happy the last time we gathered to have a young lady come and say, I wanna be baptized. Amen. We give glory to God. Yeah. This is what our faith tells us, Amen. that God is not dead, he ain't done with us. Celebrate. So while the choir sings, the doors of the church are open. We all stand. And if there's one that would choose to follow in Chelsea's footsteps, we welcome you. communion meal. And when I say deacons, I'm talking about the entire diaconet. God does not make a lot of distinctions.
communion is a bit different. Typically we would pass the plate and you would take one, but has everyone who wishes to participate been served? Does everyone have one? Go forth, we go forth in Jesus' name, out of our arms. 